Hey guys, subscribe for daily knife content. And if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for links to some great online retailers. There's also individual links for knives that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and today I've got a very special custom knife overview and presentation to share with you guys. This is a Chad Nell ESG dress. What does dress mean? It means um, extreme embellishment, I guess. Uh, what we're looking at here is an upgraded version of this model. Um, there are less expensive versions of this knife that have been made. This is a handmade knife, by the way, custom knife. Um, but with the addition of these white Muir Timascus uh, bolsters uh, and the uh, white Muir Timascus pocket clip, right? Um, essentially, what you're looking at here is an expensive version of an already expensive knife, right? That's what dress means when we're talking about custom knives. If you're new to my channel, you don't know how I do custom knives. I don't do reviews on custom knives. I just do uh, presentations, essentially, show and tell. That's what I like to do with stuff like this. I don't normally do videos on custom knives. I'm not really a custom knife channel, but as an enthusiast, I find them interesting. I like to talk about them periodically. Normally, when I do a knife video on a production knife, I uh, talk about you know materials and I talk about uh, you know, fit and finish and whether or not I think it's worth it, you know, for the money. I talk about uh, whether or not it's, you know, how practical it's going to be, you know, for certain types of people, stuff like that. Uh, and I do measurements and all that stuff. I don't do that at all with something like this. This is extremely expensive. Um, it is not available. <laughs> um, and uh, it's uh, functional, definitely. If you're confused about whether or not something like this is functional, yes, 100%. If the owner wanted to take this out and beat on it like you would a $200 Spyderco or a $150 Spyderco, yeah, 100%. It, uh, it is fully capable of standing up to that type of use. There's a difference between something like this and a true art knife. An art knife is one that is just meant to look at and would fall apart under heavy use. This will not do that. No, this is 100% capable of being used. Whether or not it ends up being used is 100% up to the person who bought it. It is pointless to complain about whether or not something like this actually gets used because it ain't your knife. It's Scott's knife. Scott, thank you so much for sending this in. I appreciate that. He sent me a whole bunch of really complicated and beautiful objects that are very intimidating. Somebody who runs a knife channel is, and is expected to bring something like this uh, in front of, you know, usually thousands of people and give his thoughts, right? Very intimidating. Oh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys that you're about to get, you know, every last bit of the appropriate information. No, I'm going to give my thoughts and hope that I do a good enough job because this is definitely not my area of expertise, but I can't help it. I want to look at stuff like this. I want to talk about it, right? Oh, my area of expertise, <coughs> just so you guys know, is generally between five and uh, five dollars when it comes to knives. Knives that cost between five dollars and about one thousand. I'm pretty confident about talking about whether or not the elements that come with it, those types of knives, you know, are going to be worth it to different types of people. Whether or not it's appropriate, right? Certain levels of fit and finish. Every dollar beyond the $1,000 mark for me gets exponentially more confusing and intimidating. So, that's why we just do show and tell. What's the point of talking about a knife that is super expensive and totally unavailable? What's the point? Why do you do that to a metal complex? I don't know, because I want to. <laughs> I, want, I want to talk about this, right? If you guys want to watch, you can. And if you don't want to watch, I've got 1,600 other uploads that you are uh, fully welcome to enjoy. So, um, we're going to do a couple of things here. First off, four minutes in. Uh, thanks so much to my generous patrons who are supporting me right now. You can find a link for my Patreon right down in the description. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. Do some basic measurements. Very basic stuff. Not going to do my normal thing here. Overall length of the Chadnell Custom ESG is coming in at about 8.4 inches overall. Blade length is coming in at about 3.65. Cutting edge is coming in at about 3.5 inches. So this is definitely a full size knife. We'll do a couple of quick size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1. Because of the angle here, it's actually making it uh, look like it's longer than the Rat 1, but it isn't. The Rat 1 is just a little teeny tiny bit longer at 8.6 inches. And then the Spyderco Para 3 
coming in at seven and a quarter. There you go. I think that's uh, enough in terms of size comparisons. Let's talk about weight here. So we're looking at, what are we looking at for materials? Fairly thick blade stock. I'm going to guess. I'm not going to measure it because I don't want to put my calipers on it. This looks to be about 165 thousandths. We're not talking about Medford thickness in overall dimensions, but definitely between the liners and the Timascus bolsters and the, uh, the marble uh, carbon fiber scales. Yeah, we're looking at some decent thickness here. Um, it looks like it's probably about 165 thousandths throughout. So, yeah, um, that's going to equate to a decently heavy knife. Um, but I don't think it's anything insane. Uh, weight on this guy, yeah, 6.07 ounces. Look, obviously, uh, if you've been carrying the Benchmade bug out, this is going to seem heavy. Um, if you carry a, a full-size knife or you're used to hinderer knives, right, this is going to be reasonable territory for you. Uh, truthfully, if you are familiar with my channel, you know that my preferences generally lie between uh, and with knives that, to, that come uh, that weigh between four and about six and a half ounces, right? So this is fine for me. What do I always say about thickness? Uh, some people, you know, get all bent out of shape. But, oh, it's too thick. It's blah, thickness, right? Whatever. I mean, it's even further whatever right now because, again, this is a it's a custom knife that is unobtainable and extremely expensive, right? So, but still, I'm going to comment on it. Uh, when a knife has some excess thickness to it or some excess girthiness, what I appreciate is when things are contoured because then it's more of a this is feeling filling the hand in an appropriate or beneficial way if I were going to use it. So. In a scenario where I was the type of person who could afford to purchase and use something like this, right? Which I can't. But if I if I could, uh, the uh, the excess thickness here really doesn't bother me because everything is nicely contoured and rounded off. It actually gives me more of a feeling of confidence than something that is just flat and blocky. Uh, the harder I squeeze something like this, the more I feel it. Something that is thicker and, and contoured, I can squeeze this as hard as I want and it's just going to remain comfortable. It's funny how that, uh, you know, obviously a knife can be too thick, right? We're talking about thickness like what, what you get with like a Medford Praetorian. That's, I mean, it's refined in its own way, but that's like a blocky thickness that really isn't comfortable uh, if I was going to squeeze it really hard. I mean, if I was wearing gloves, okay, fine, but barehanded, holding on to something like this that is thick and is nicely rounded. Yeah, it's comfortable. The ergonomic lines in this thing are also really, really good. It's funny, with a custom knife like this, I'm really distracted by its aesthetic beauty. I'm distracted by all of the craziness going on here. So it's easy to forget about things, like just simple things like ergonomic lines. Yeah, this is nice. I mean, like, <laughs> this is obviously, when you're, when you're talking about custom knives, the world of custom knives can go all over the place, right? Uh, you can get insane things that have nowhere near reasonable ergonomic lines uh, or, you know, blade shapes that are wild and exotic and more fantasy oriented, right? Sometimes it's just the, the maker showing off how crazy of, a, of an object that they can make, whether or not it's actually, you know, like beneficial in normal use, that kind of just goes out the window sometimes. But also you have corners of the custom knife world where the object is 100% or the design right? In this case, the design of the ESG is obviously one that is meant to be used or meant to, you know, benefit the end user. The ergonomic lines here are super, super comfortable. This is an object that would give me extreme confidence in a usage scenario, right? Uh, this area right here, uh, and then this slight swell, and then comes back up and then back here. It's comfortable, but I can also move around a little bit. I don't feel, you know, super confined, but I also feel completely and totally locked in because of the shape of the pocket clip, the fact that all the corners are rounded down. Yeah, it's this is super comfortable. I, I really appreciate that. It's just funny. Sorry, I'm going to wipe off this bolster again. It's funny, little details like that that I... <laughs> it's so easy to overlook because this thing is so beautiful. Uh, like I said, blade steel CTSX HP, which we sadly don't see enough of. Um, this knife is from 2016, by the way, and whether or not the ESG is a model that's still available, um, something that you can get, you know, I have no idea. Um, I uh, saw older uh, listings for the ESG, different types of ESGs uh, on uh, Fort Henry Custom Knives, 
which is a good place to go and look you know, for custom knives, but there are a lot of different places. Um, how do you get on the books or how do you get on the thing? You know, if I want a Chad, I, I don't know That's you're probably going to need to contact Chad Nell directly. Um, <coughs> it's not really, you know, the goal of this video is to, to, you know, explain exactly how to get your hands on something like this, really just looking at it and appreciating it. But anyways, um, XHP. Uh, XHP is a, still considered a super steel here in 2021. It is uh, uh, powder formed. Um, edge retention is somewhere in between S35VN and M390. It's very stainless, more stainless than S35VN, a little less stainless, I think, than M390. Um, most of what you're going to find on the internet is that XHP is an extremely preferable steel. Why we don't see it on more production knives nowadays, I have no idea, but it still seems to be a steel that we see on custom knives, or at least the ones that I've been paying attention to. And again, the custom knife world is not my area of expertise. But yeah, I like CTS XHP. Um, periodically, you see it in knives that are less than 100 bucks. I remember um, we saw uh, XHP on the Boker collection. There was a uh, short run of Boker Kalashnikovs that were in CTS XHP, right? But that's uh, one. That, that's another. You know, it's it, it's like I always say. You know, people. A lot of times, it's really easy for newcomers in the knife world to reduce the value of of the knife to the materials. Um, obviously, I don't want to see um, uh, VG10 uh, on a knife that costs over a thousand dollars. That's not the best example. I don't want to see OS 8 um, or 8CR 13 MOV on a knife that costs over $1,000, right? But does the, the cost of the knife, you know, is it does it weigh heavily on the materials? No, not, not really, truthfully. It's basically how many processes, how expensive are the processes that go into uh, the knife, right? How much wear goes into the machines or the tools that are used to create the knife. <coughs> How long does it take? Uh, what's the uh, country of uh, uh, the origin country of manufacturing, right? Because labor costs more or less, right? Time costs more or less in different parts of the world, right? So when you're looking at <coughs> a handmade knife that was made in the United States, that likely has anywhere from 40 to 80 hours of work in it, yeah, you're going to end up with a super high price tag, regardless of whether or not CTS XHP can be found on, you know, other production knives that cost less than $100. What I'm saying is, is that if you're new to this, if you're new to the knife world, don't zero in on that. Don't come to the conclusion that materials have a static value associated with them, because it's not the case. It's not like marble carbon fiber is worth X amount. And CTS XHP is worth that. No, that is definitely not how that works at all. Don't get you, the the whole your your journey through the knife world is going to be confusing and frustrating if you lock in on that idea. Um, but anyways, CTS XHP, I think uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful blade steel. We have a flat, pretty prominent flat that carries out about eighty percent, eighty yeah, about eighty percent the length of the blade. We have a beautiful harpoon notch up there. Uh, I'm a big fan, uh, aesthetically, of harpoon blades. In fact, that's, I would say, as far as all, you know, all the different blade shapes that are out there, I think harpoon-style blades are, are probably my favorite. Why? I don't really know. Depending on the placement of it, sometimes you can put your thumb back there and I guess have control over certain parts of the edge if you're doing detail work like, I don't know, uh, whittling? <laughs> I'm not really sure. I, I just like it. You know, sometimes you can appreciate certain elements of things without being able to identify what benefits they have when you're using the blade, right? It's me escaping, attempting to <laughs> escape having to explain why I think what I think. <laughs> oh boy. I don't take myself that seriously, guys. I have thoughts and I say them and sometimes they resonate with people and sometimes they don't. But am I a professional uh, that is, uh, you know, perfectly, that has, who has perfectly honed his, his craft? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. Um, but yeah, still fun. Anyways, very beautiful. We have a hand rub satin finish and you can see that that's uh, is uh, continues up on the swedge and down here 
on the, uh, the bevel past the flat. The flat is just a, it looks, well, it looks like just a generic satin finish, but you have contrast. Something that I look for um, when I'm looking at uh, both hand rub satin finishes and, you know, machine satin finishes is consistency. Whether it's done by machine or done by hand, especially if it's done by machine, it should be consistent. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I have a, a Strider AR, uh, a three-quarter AR, that is, I guess you'd call that a mid-tech. There are some elements of it that are, you know, there's, there's hand work in it, and then there's a lot of machine work. I uh, pretty much expect the, um, <coughs> the, fin the finish, you know, on a $600 knife to be perfect, right? Where's the line where it's expected to be perfect? I, I don't know exactly, but definitely on a $600 knife, a $600 knife I expect it to be perfect, right? Especially because I believe the finish is done by machine. There's an area on that knife on one side where whoever was controlling the machine just went, Nyeh! and it just went off to one side. And, you know, when you... Uh, when you turn a blade and it reflects light in different directions, flaws like that will pop out uh, and make themselves known. So uh, I, at a certain angle, everything looks perfect on that knife. And then I turn it and I see that one spot. And I'm like, God dang it, right? Now, that's a knife that I carry and use. So I, I mean, I, it doesn't, I guess now it doesn't bother me so much. But every time I see it, I'm like, God dang it, stupid, right? So... That's how I judge the quality of the finish or those types of finishes is consistency. And that's honestly the way that I judge the quality of any finish. It should be, whatever the finish is, it should be consistent. There shouldn't be discoloration or blotchiness unless that is intentional, right? I mean, if we're talking about, I guess, I don't know why I keep talking about Medford's. If we're talking about the Vulcan finish that is designed to be chaotic and not consistent, right? It's designed to be kind of a mess. Um, then okay, right? But if the goal is consistency and it isn't consistent, right? If there's on satin finished knives, if there's belt burn, darker areas, right? Blotchy areas. Oh, that looks bad. With a hand rub satin finish, all of these lines that are going this way should be perfectly consistent. There should not be an area where it looks like bram, they went a different way, right? Because that looks gross and ugly. And as you turn it, the light uh, you know, bounces off it in different directions and reveals, you know, areas that, you know, if there are flaws, it would reveal those areas. Um, in a knife like this, you'll see that there are no flaws. It is perfect. Beyond perfect, actually. I mean, I've called less than this, aesthetically, perfect before. This is beautiful. Done by hand, done very, very well. It's the same on both sides. Magnificent. It really, really looks nice. Uh, again, not that I'm, you know, a perfect judge or have handled thousands of custom knives or, or enough to be able to say definitively, you know, but gosh, <coughs> as far as what I've experienced, that looks fantastic. It really is beautiful. How's the action on this guy? Um, this is running on ceramic bearings. Uh, I think the best way to describe it is a whoosh. Um, it's, I mean, here's the thing. Action when we're talking about perfect action, actually has many different forms. There is no specific one perfect form of action, right? There's action that I, you know, expect to feel on a $50 knife, right? The budget knife world has gotten pretty good in terms of flipping action, right? Is it the same as something like this? No. Now, there are definitely custom makers out there that are not, you know... <laughs> Their knives are expensive because there's a lot of work that goes into them, and then the action is questionable. Um, I've got to be honest with you guys. I've, I've handled a few old Marfione customs where the action was ugh. Now, newer ones maybe are better, but if we're talking about that, you know, sometimes that does occur. But is there a difference between a $50 Civivi and the action something like this? Oh, yeah. This is a substantially, substantially better. It's very clean, very consistent. There's no bumpiness, lumpiness, grittiness inside of there, right? When you pull on that flipper tab, there is zero chance that, that, is, that it's going to fail. It is going to deploy. But it's different than what I experience with a Shirogorov. It's different than what I experience with um, <coughs> um, a, a Brian Ado, the, uh, the arch nemesis that I handled, the one that I freaked out about, right? That, that action, for whatever reason, synced up with me, and it was, you know, all of the little... 
elements were just exactly what I wanted to, or that was a, it was a feeling that I had never experienced and found out that I really, really liked, right? Does that mean that this isn't as good as that or that there's a difference in quality? No, it's just up on the same plane, right? We've reached this area where it is, this whole plane is perfection and there are lots of different types of action that could end up here, right? Does the flipper tab feel natural? Does it feel comfortable when I, you know, go to rest my finger uh, on the flipper tab? Yeah. When I pull down on it, um, does the detent feel, you know, tuned properly, right? Is it too, is it too light? No. Is it too heavy? No. It's right there in between, right? The detent is still present and clicky, which is something that I look for. It's very smooth. Whoosh is the best way that I can describe it. It is perfect. Uh, there's no flaw. It was obviously done by somebody who knows how to properly tune a detent, and it's perfect. It's not very loud, right? I'm I'm kind of a, a creature of sound. I like I like heavy clicks and clacks. I like to hear everything, but I don't want to feel any sloppy friction inside of the pivot, right? That's why the Arch Nemesis appeals to me so much, um, and why I'm not applying the same amount of enthusiasm to this. It's very very good. It's, a, it's uh, an action that I think anybody looking to spend this much money, um, you know, would be appreciative of, right? It's just different. Um, but yeah, super smooth, ceramic bearings, flips like a dream, all of that. It's all there. It's hard to come up with unique words every single time for, you know, action that's varies slightly from, you know, other knives that are in the same territory that also have really good action, Right. I can't sit here, I'm not going to sit here and, and uh, you know, feed you guys a bunch of unnecessary pomp and frill. It's really, really good. If you're going to spend this much money on a Chad Nell and you're wondering, is the action good? Yeah, it is. I, I probably should have just said that right away. Curiously, this doesn't have a sharpening choil. I'm not sure why. Um, maybe if you order a custom knife from Chad Nell and you really want a sharpening choil, maybe he'll put one in there. I, I have no idea. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the bolster is definitely the highlight of this particular one. Um, with a lot of Timascus, there, there are white and black options for the Timascus, right? When the custom knife maker orders it from the Timascus factory, I don't know where you, there's lots of different types of Timascus, right? It's different patterns and things like that. But the difference between white and black, this is the white Muir, and it's these areas here that appear really, really light blue. In the black version of the Timascus, you could imagine that area is much darker. I like the uh, the white Timascus, a lot of that stuff. I, I find that to be more appealing. I don't know if it just contrasts better with the oranges and the purples. I don't know. It just, it pops a little better. Um, you know, and I, I wish I had some, some black Timascus to compare so I could tell you guys what I'm, I'm talking about. But this is the kind of stuff that looks good to me. Uh, Ask a bunch of different people who have handled a bunch of this stuff, and you're probably going to get different opinions, right? It's not necessarily better or worse. It's just a matter of personal taste. I like how this looks. I also like how he did the pivot here. It's sort of a, I don't know if we call this like a volcano pivot. Um, it comes to a little bit of a peak. It's not sharp, um, but it looks nice. It's polished and contrasts well with the uh, bolster. The screws holding in the bolster and the scales are anodized blue. I think that looks a lot nicer, despite what I just said about the pivot. I, I think it, if these were satin, it would kind of look trashy. <laughs> um, they're not hidden. They're right out in the open. So the fact that they're anodized, I don't know. It just looks a little better than if they weren't anodized, right? looks pretty good. Um, there's a little bit of a gap here between the uh, marble carbon fiber and the bolster. It's pretty consistent. It's pretty much the same. Um, but you have to remember... So this is a handmade knife. So the scales and the bolsters are, to my knowledge, cut by hand. Um, so there's more room for error in something like this than something like a really expensive machine production knife. Generally speaking, you will find more flaws on a handmade knife than a less expensive fully production knife uh, or full production knife. <clears throat> That's generally the case, right? So when I see stuff like that, it's like, eh, I want everything to be perfect and seamless, and sometimes it is. On some custom knives, it is. Remember, this is from 2016, so maybe if the exact same knife was made by Chad Nell now in 2021, 
there would be no gap here and it would be perfectly seamless, right? It would be consistent all the way around. I don't know. Um, that is one area that I think most people looking to spend this much money on a knife right in this territory, I think they would look at that and consider it a flaw. It is what it is. Uh, the uh, marble carbon fiber looks great. Um, so for anybody who's not familiar with marble carbon fiber, generally speaking, there's going to be voids. That's the nature of the beast. It is extremely rare to find a knife made with marble carbon fiber in any price point that has no voids in the, in the carbon fiber, right? Not regular carbon fiber, just like marble carbon fiber in general, right, is going to have some voids. I think there's maybe one area on this that's right here. Just a couple. Everything else, surprisingly, is just about perfect. <coughs> that's, um, you know, that's why I always say it's, it's not just the material and that has a static cost associated with it. Usually, the more money you spend, when we're talking about marble carbon fiber, the less likely you are to see voids. If you're looking at uh, knives, like Riot uses it a lot in the $400 price point. It's going to have voids, which is going to be frustrating, you know, because 400 bucks is still a lot of money. But that's generally what you're going to see there. So it's nice that I'm looking at this material and seeing it's like 99% voidless. So that's nice. And honestly, you know, the seam work everywhere else, right? We have that little gap right there. But everywhere else, it looks really good. It's perfect everywhere else. On this side... Not quite. There, there is, a, you know, you can see the line there, but it's not a, it's not the same as as on this side. But still, largely impressive, um, you know, by my standards when it comes to a custom knife. Very, very beautiful. Very nicely knocked down. Very smooth back here. This is all great. Nicely cut out in here, underneath the, um, you know, in between the, well, the the area that you're meant to engage the liner lock, right? It's been nicely cut out, so it's very easy to disengage. Very comfortable. No double clutch or anything like that. Very smooth action. Not quite completely and totally fall shut, but very controlled and very consistent. Right? I've said many times that completely and totally fall shut action is not, you know, we fetishize that, but that's not necessarily indicative of perfection. Right? My personal preferences when it comes to action are you know, smooth, but controlled. I don't need it to be false shut. Sometimes I actually prefer that it is just a step behind false shut so that I can always get my fingers out of the way. That's about where this is. That's about, <coughs> this is about my preference when it comes to action, right? It just doesn't have that loud click, you know, that came with the, the arch nemesis, right? I like a little bit of a louder action, a little bit more of a, um, what we authoritative, I guess, <laughs> but uh, this is still very, very good, right? Just talking about personal preferences now. Backspacer is floating and is also marble carbon fiber. I don't know how I feel personally about the floating backspacer thing. I mean, I, I kind of like it when it's, you know, a perfect material, you know, whatever the material is of the scale and then the liner and then the backspacer and then the liner and then the, I kind of like when it's all, you know, together so that you can look and see how perfect the seams are, the, you know, where they, they meet up. But this does look good, right? Some people really like that. Um, <clears throat> pocket clip looks beautiful. Like I said, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's very functional. We have this continuous rise uh, or this ramp here, so it's going to rise to meet whatever thickness of pocket. It's a popsicle stick shape, um, and uh, this, this is coming off as a review, but again, I'm Talking about it, you know, giving my opinions on things is, again, it's not really a review. Um, but uh, normally I say, well, popsicle stick style clips are kind of boring unless they go perfectly with the lines of the knife. And that's actually what's happening here. Um, it goes perfectly with the lines on this knife, and I think it looks great. Um, I like the contrast of uh, Timascus and carbon fiber. So it looks nice sitting on top of that, uh, that scale there. Carries about medium. It doesn't carry shallow, doesn't carry deep. That's just fine. doesn't really bother me. Screws on the pocket clip are um, purple on the inside, which is interesting. <laughs> I like that. This is a liner lock, and I actually prefer that. I've come to prefer that more and more over frame locks. 
um, because no matter where I put my hands on this, it's going to flip. Uh, it doesn't really, there's no area to accidentally put too much pressure on because the liner is underneath the bolster and the, uh, the scale here. So I think that's great. This is a beautiful knife. What did this run? In 2016, it ran something like $1,600. Um, I think that uh, there are knives that Chad Nell makes that cost less than that, and there are, you know, as is the case with many custom knife makers, there are knives that cost substantially more, right? Uh, if you're somebody who regularly spends this much money on knives, um, do I think that, uh, you know, Chad Nell knows what he's doing and makes a, an excellent product for that price? Yeah, I mean, as far as that, what that's worth with me, again, this isn't my area of expertise, but I have handled you know, a handful of knives that are really, really expensive. And um, this is impressive for what it costs. I'm not going to pretend to understand every last little thing that goes into a knife like this. Um, but uh, yeah, this is impressive, right? Now, if you're looking at this, you, if you, um, you know, are somebody who's never spent more than a, one to $200 on a knife, and you're looking at this, and the fact that it exists frustrates you, right? Um, if you would never spend this much money on a knife, then just go about your day. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's one of those things, you know, like I said at the beginning, that custom knives exist and people who buy custom knives exist. Uh, it's been that way for a while. In fact, it's a pretty healthy market. There are quite a few people who buy uh, and collect custom knives and there are a lot of custom knife makers out there. In fact, you know, their existence uh, is why we have less expensive production versions of some of this stuff, right? Um, so it's, in some ways, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Do with that information what you will. My point is, crying and fussing over the fact that expensive knives exist is pointless if you never plan to buy one. Um, so, you know, they, they are what they are. Don't, don't, um... Don't, uh, uh, you know, dwell on it and ruin your day over it. It's not worth it. I think it's incredible. I can't afford stuff like this, right? I can appreciate it. I can't fully understand it. I hope to, you know, get better at it. I hope to uh, be a more comprehensive. Well, not really. The goal of this channel is not to become a custom knife reviewer. But I would like to learn more. Every time I handle something like this, it's a learning experience for me. I hope that it's entertaining for people who actually did sit here for 32 minutes to hear me talk about this. Uh, and Scott, I hope that um, uh, this was um, <laughs> uh, entertaining for you, the gentleman who sent this to me. But um, anyways, I think that's going to be pretty much it. I don't know that there's a whole lot more that I can say. Um, this was fun. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, guys, make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody.